Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see everybody here today. We have called this press conference to condemn the heinous racist terrorist act that took place in Buffalo, New York. Before we actually have the presenters talk, what I'd like to do is first read the names of the 10 people who were killed in Buffalo, New York. And then we'll have a moment of silence. Peyton Gendron shot 13 people and killed 10. 11 of the 13 people that were shot were black. 10 of them were killed. The 10 people who were killed in Buffalo were Celestine Cheney, Roberta Drury, Andre McNeil, Catherine Massey, Margus Morrison, Hayward Patterson, Aaron Salter, Geraldine Talley, Ruth Whitfield, and Pearl Young. Could we have a moment of silence? for those 10, please. Thank you. And I also want to call attention to the fact that today, May 19th, is also the birthday of Malcolm X, about whom you'll hear more from one of our speakers here today. Originally, we thought about having this actually uh, on Monday, but we decided to wait until today because what happened in Buffalo brings to mind some of the things that Malcolm X said back in 1965 in the early and mid 60s. Malcolm X was one of the foremost opponents of racism and racist violence, one of the foremost advocates of black liberation and self-determination. And we believe that if Malcolm X were alive today, he would condemn in the most scathing and deserved terms what happened in Buffalo, New York. What happened in Buffalo was an act of white supremacist, racist terrorism. It was an act of mass murder. Perhaps one of the largest acts of mass murder that have happened on the East Coast, if not in the country. When I heard about what happened in Buffalo, I thought of what happened at Mother Emanuel Church, where nine people were killed. But this person shot 13 people, killing 10 of them. This was a heinous, murderous act. And we are not going to let it get swept under the rug. We are not going to let it fade from the headlines. We are not going to let these attacks on black people become normalized. Already you can see the issue starting to move from the front page to the back page already. But we are not going to let that happen. Today, we've come not only to condemn what happened, but more importantly, to call for action. For the last two years, in the past two years, three reports have been issued by the New Jersey Office 
of Homeland Security and Preparedness, pointing out that in this state, in the state of New Jersey, that the greatest threat to public safety is white extremist terrorism. Now, this is not the People's Organization for Progress report, not the NAACP report. This is the state of New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. They issued a report in 20, they issued another report in 21, and they just issued one at the end of March, saying the greatest threat to public safety in New Jersey is white racist extremism. The question we ask today is what is being done about it? If this is, in fact, the greatest threat to public safety, you would think that it would be reflected in the environment. You would think that we would be seeing meetings and discussions and legislation, but all we've had are these reports and not even a significant response to the reports. So we're here today to call for action, action on this issue. Condolences, I'm sure the family appreciates the condolences, but the families of the victims, I think, would want action on this issue. What is the state of New Jersey, the county of Essex, the municipalities in this state, what are they doing about the issue of white supremacist racist domestic terrorism? What are their budgets? What agencies are being mobilized? What funds have been allocated? What personnel have been assigned to deal with the problem? And what plans have been put together? Does anyone have a plan to make sure that this will not happen in the state of New Jersey? And I guarantee you that if we do not put significant preventative measures in place, that incidents like that which occurred in Buffalo, New York, will also happen here in New Jersey. We also know that there's been an uptick in hate crimes. We may have not had a mass shooting, but there has been a significant increase in hate crimes in the state of New Jersey. And these crimes go across different demographic populations, but I have to say, African Americans are still leading in the number of victims of hate crimes here in the state of New Jersey. But we've also seen hate crimes against Latinos, against uh, Jewish uh, brothers and sisters, and against Asian people have also gone up. We've heard about it, it's been reported on, but the question we are asking today, the demand that we are making here today, is that there must be action. Our government officials at the municipal level, the county level, the state level, and the federal level need to step forward and tell us what they are doing. What are their programs? What agencies have been mobilized? What funds have been allocated? What personnel have been put in charge to deal with this problem? And what plans have been made? And if they don't have these things, they better have these things right away, right now, before we have an incident in New Jersey. In addition to that, what I would call for today, I call on Governor Murphy to convene a state, what should I call it, Bill? A state summit, a state conference, a state meeting on the issue of racist terrorism and hate crime in New Jersey. Call, bring together all the law enforcement people, all the experts in the issue, all the academics, the legislators, the educators, the clergy, the grassroots advocates, the anti-racist organizations, 
fighting racism. Bring them together in a statewide conference to show that in fact this issue is a priority. If, if, if it's discussed today and not tomorrow, it's obviously not a priority. The New Jersey Office of Homeland Security is saying this should be a priority. It's, this is the problem. The question is what's being done about it. So we're calling, and this idea does not fall from the sky. I rarely have an original idea. In 2001, the day that 9-11 happened, I was standing in the, what's that hotel across the street from the Atlantic City Convention Center? Is it Sheraton? I was in, the, in my room at the Sheraton Hotel. I was at the Sheraton Hotel because the then governor of, governor of New Jersey had convened a statewide conference on racial profiling. But the second day of the conference, 9-11 happened and everybody had to leave. And that was the end of the action on racial profiling. And here we are now, 20 years later, more than 20 years later, and for the past two years, this issue of white supremacist domestic terrorism has been identified as a leading threat to public safety, and we're calling for action. So that's what I have to say. Uh, now I'm going to ask for Charles Hall, who is the president of Local 108, the retail uh, uh, service workers, employees, uh, to give his opinion on the matter. Thank you. Good evening, all. It is a uh, sad, sad time in this country. I'd first like to start by just offering my prayers to the, those that lost lives in Buffalo, those that were present in that supermarket as terrorism took place in a black community against black people it, it, it's just too much too much hatred we're at a point in this country where there's a racial divide and there's a lot of people harboring a lot of hatred thinking that somebody's going to replace them and that theory is being promoted throughout our country that there's a replacement of white people and therefore they need to mobilize it's being discussed openly on cable tv and other stations think back when Trump was in the White House and we had marches around the country where the Ku Klux Klans suddenly resurfaced. Where people walked around in Nazi gear and tiki tamps, tiki uh, lamps in our very communities. This is, uh, this is bad. We have to protect our communities and we're here in New Jersey and we're in Newark and you say well why are you worried about Buffalo because in every state throughout the United States there are people of color there are supermarkets where people of color shop didn't have to be a supermarket it could have been a mall it could have been any place where people gather and it's just a sad time and, and we have to call on our government to make sure, number one, that we're all safe. But as Larry said, something has to be done. There has to be a plan of action to say hatred, racism, white supremacy, hatred of any kind does not have a place in the United States of America. But when you turn a blind eye, and you look the other way, and you act as if it's not a big deal, it could be coming to your doorstep next. I believe, I believe that we're at a tipping point where we can have mass disruption
throughout the United States. Chaos, hatred, killings. If our elected officials, if, 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 if people of community organizations don't speak up and demand better. I think we, we've seen it all now. We've seen it all this on the East Coast. To have something like that happen is it's just mind-boggling. And as I read through and I looked through the different articles, store one of the stories had a little girl with her mother who was on the floor while bullets were flying throughout the supermarket and she would be damaged the rest of her life for being a part, for being a witness to that mass, mass terrorism in our communities. There needs to be a time of healing. We need to come together. We need to try to talk out our differences. But somebody needs to take a leadership position from the federal government to the state government to municipalities and start saying this is wrong. If you're found involved in this type of behavior, there's gonna be consequences. And on the other side of it, we have to educate these people. This young man was 18 years old, full of hatred that likely came from his parents. And that's what's out there now. And, and, and you have to read up on this theory that we're somehow different and we're out to replace them. It's called the replacement theory. And they're serious about it. So we got replacement theory, we got white supremacy, we got neo-Nazis, we got the Ku Klux Klan. All of them have one thing in common, is hate, and they think that we're trying to take something from them. I call on our governor here, number one, to keep us safe, number two, to find a healing within our communities, and, and, and this has just got to stop because if we go any further, I don't think anybody yeah. will be safe. Yeah. So I'm going to do my part, and, and, and I hope everybody, the clergy, community, everybody will come in as one. Yeah. I'll say this, interestingly enough, I represent minority supermarkets throughout New Jersey. Really? And I got on the phone with all the owners of those supermarkets to ask them, how are you keeping our members safe, and how are you keeping the community safe that shops in your store? So I thank Pop for having me here today, and just, you know, I'm going to keep it live and keep the talk going so that it's not swept under the rug. Thank you, thank you, thank you Charlie. Thank you. Next, I'm going to call Sue Altman from the Working Families Party. Sue? All right. Thanks, everyone. I'll be really quick today. Um, both gentlemen, thank you for your kind and important words. The tragedy in Buffalo defies an ability to even speak of it. Um, this murderer, this terrorist, drove 300 miles to inflict pain and death and suffering. It wasn't an accident. It was premeditated. It was racially motivated. And the calls to action today couldn't be more appropriate. If we think we are not 300 miles away from another person willing to do this, then we are living in a world of delusion. As the gentlemen before me have said, white supremacy is present, it is real, racism is violent in its very core, and it is very much and tragically and deeply a part of the fabric in this country. It is alive today, it is active today, and it is an active threat to communities all over New Jersey, all over the country, but all over New Jersey. I appreciate the call to action. I think it's extraordinarily important to have these conversations, to treat it like the, the existential threat to community, to human life, to the soul of our country as it is, because it is an existential threat. We need to put resources into this problem. And while I think the calls to do more um, legislation on guns and access to guns is important, we also have to look upstream from the weapons themselves. What motivates, what cultivates, what sort of poison in the media and in popular culture and on social media 
has been with us since this country's inception, that has found a way through to flourish in this day when so many are in pain. So thank you so much for hosting us today. It is an awful, awful thing. It's absolutely horrible. And I pray for this country because I agree, I think we're at a crossroads. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Next we'll have former Assemblyman Bill Payne. Thank you, Larry. Um, this latest uh, killings that exactly happened just a couple of days ago, you know, it's been repeated again also uh, elsewhere during that weekend. There was others that were killed as well, and racist uh, types. The fact is that this is so deep, so very, very deep. It's been going on forever. It was mentioned, uh, Larry mentioned before, that, you know, back when uh, Malcolm, Malcolm was here, you know, we had the opportunity to invite Malcolm to us right here in Newark, Seton Hall, you know, at that Rutgers University, rather, up there, where he came and spoke to us, those of us that were there at the time active, because the, the, the problems were continuing to grow, and getting worse, and they were trying to come up with some solutions. It seems to me that after all this time, we, we they simply must find a solution. And let me tell you something. One of the best things to do is make sure, it's been mentioned that the governor could call upon the governor to, to uh, lead a uh, discussion about how to re address these uh, conditions that exist. But not only, the, not only the governor, but people that we have elected to those seats down in Trenton and where else, they need to become involved. They simply can't stand on the sidelines. As a matter of fact, all of them should be here right now, say that we have to do something about it. And I think that we need to call upon those who have been elected to represent us, to, to address the problems that exist and do everything we possibly can to stop it because of it going on and on and on. There are some who have served in these legislature uh, bodies who have done some things over the years, but we seem to make sure that we do it. This killing is, is everywhere. And I said, we're the ones that have the ones been on the end of the, uh, the bullets that, that have been shot. The schools are somewhere where, where this young person is learning this hate uh, is, is, is beyond me, but we certainly need to make sure that what's happening in our schools, because that's where it starts. And unfortunately, uh, too many of these young people come from homes where this hate has been taught them all their lives. But there's somebody has an obligation to make sure that we are not developing young people who are there are with hatred in them for what? At the age of 18, you mean to tell me that the experience of this this boy was uh, was so much so that that he had, at 18 he learned it somewhere that's up to us we have an obligation to make sure that we call upon those who are teaching our youngsters and other habits and still when i was down in trenton i introduced legislation called the amistad legislation to make sure that everybody know that our children know the contributions that we made to make this country good this is our country too we we made the it's a traffic light, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have to make sure that not only our children learn about the contribution we've made, but everybody who goes to school, whether they're white, black, or whatever they are, it's there and we teach them. Otherwise, we're gonna have the same thing over and over and over again. And we also make, have to make sure that we call upon those, as I say, who were elected to public office to make sure that they have, we have their voices heard so that they, we know that they're out there fighting to, to avoid this situation. It's just been going on much, much, much too long. And I know that if we get together as we are here now, this should be, at the, I know this is a press conference, but uh, 100 people should be standing back here. We need to make sure that everybody is involved with this because it's a responsibility for all of us. Some of you know that I worked you know, with Dr. King. I knew Dr. King and that, and that, and, 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 and many others there. But if this fight goes on, it's still here. So we need to find an answer. And I'm glad to be part of this and do whatever we can to make sure that, uh, that our society, our country, is going to conquer, conquer this, and that we'll stand together until we find an answer to this solution. So thank you very, very much, Larry, for all that you've been doing. Thank you, Assemblyman. Next, we're going to hear from Danielle Carpita from the Surge organization. She'll tell you what Surge means. Thank you, Chairman Ham, and thanks everybody for having me. Um, I am a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice New Jersey. We're the Jersey chapter of the National Group um, acronym and for the abbreviation SCURJ. We're a group of mostly white folks that want to support black liberation and civil rights and direct accountability with people of color um, who are working to organize in their community like POP. And uh, I have to say that it is a tragic, tragic day and no one is surprised that this continues. 
uh, when the indigenous folks experienced genocide at the hands of white supremacy, that's where this started. And it continued in various different forms. It might not have looked like a massacre like it did in Buffalo, but it looks like uh, other forms of racism and holding people of color down, whether it's economic or through redlining, through not teaching uh, black history, which is American history in schools, uh, making it harder to access uh, medical treatment or mental health by continuing to disregard the topic of reparations, which is needed for this kind of healing to happen, and by uh, demanding that law enforcement be at the forefront of trying to solve the problem of white supremacy when we know that their uh, whole institution is based off of slave patrols. So who are we really looking for to help solve this problem? Um, for us in Surge, we understand that we as white folks need to take uh, accountability or responsibility for uh, the continued racism in this country. We need to collect all the good conscious white folks together um, in a mass to say that this is not acceptable. And we need to understand that we are also, uh, we are also victims of this system. And we need to support people of color as they organize. So um, I also want to say that calling it terrorism, like we should continue to call it white supremacy. And we should not have news outlets just calling it an act of terror. That really misses the whole point. Um, so my call to action is every white person out there with a Black Lives Matter lawn sign, come join Surge, come join POP, get out here, because the lawn sign isn't doing anything. And we need more people on the ground showing that this matters, not just the people of color that are actually living in terror every day. We need white folks to show up as allies. So thank you. We're going to have one more speaker, and then we'll have questions if the press has any questions. Prince, Chief. Aziz, from the African Diaspora for Justice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, and uh, most especially Chairman um, Larry Ham for the good work that you are doing. It's a very tragic time at this time in 2022 that we continue to experience uh, the brutal massacre of the African descent. This is not acceptable at all. We stand up and join forces with every other organizations, community leaders, our elected officials that strongly believe in justice. This is the time for us to come together to unite, detest this wanton killing of innocent soul. Can you imagine leaving your children at home leaving your parents at home just to run to a grocery store to get something to eat and that will be the end of it is this the world we will should be living in is this what we should be glad about we talk about white supremacists what is that why is that why should we accommodate that why should we hide under racism to destroy other race? Is this what God has created us to be? Even animals are more living in harmony with each other than humanity. This rampage killing is becoming more and more in our society. We need a strong gun controls. We need critical check of those that are in possession of deadly weapons. The weapons are not meant to kill each other. It is time for our senators, our congressmen, our elected officials, our governors, and every legislature to stand in unison to make sure we bring an end to this wanton killing of innocent soul. African diaspora for justice stand with all other organizations that believe in our core value which is respecting one another because we all are created equal and justice should be made equally it is surprising when a black man for example in new york city amore diallo's case just trying to get into his house 
and he mistakenly got shot several times. We have not healed from that. We haven't healed from George Floyd's situation. But now this happened. And in as much as we want justice to prevail, these lunatics that choose to kill innocent soul will still just gently and friendly bring him to the prison. But when it comes to the black race, they better not, they better not put their hands in their pocket trying to get the identity card. That will be the end. When are we going to stop this racial discrimination? When are we going to stop hating each other? And when are we going to start living in harmony? I call on everyone. The time is now. Tomorrow may be too late. 2022, from the death of Martin Luther King, it's quite a long time. And the dream needs to be fully realized that we can all come to a table together, have lunch, have dinner, and dialogue together so that we can build a better nation for ourselves and our unborn children. Thank you everyone for being here and we will continue to stand up for this until victory is achieved. Thank you all. Well said, sir. Well said. Yeah. All right, are there any questions? Thank you, Prince. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the press? Any questions? Did we cover it all? Is there anybody that didn't get to say anything that wants to say something? John, did you want to say? You good? All right, all right. The, the women advocate? Yeah. What's All right, what's her name? Olayemi. Olayemi. Olayemi? Yes. Come. Let me get <laughs> And say your organization. Thank you, sir. My organization is your daughter, your daughter. We are organizations that we fight for the rights of girls and women. And just like the previous uh, speaker said, we are standing up for justice. It is time we come together as human beings. I say human beings. Doesn't matter your color. We have to continue to love ourselves. So it's a call for every one of us. No matter what your color is, what your race is, we have to come together as a people of God. And I pray that the Lord God will continue to help us to stand for justice in this nation. Thank you. Well said. Yes. You want your sign? Okay. All right. Um, are there any questions? Any other questions from anyone? I see Queen Mother Imaku on the press side. <laughs> but I want to thank everybody, everyone for coming out today. I'm not going to prolong it. Uh, the only thing I want to end with is remind everybody that this struggle is an ongoing one. That the investigation has just begun into the shooting. And, you know, in this country, you're innocent until proven guilty, so he is the alleged shooter, Peyton Gendron. But we want justice. We want justice for all those families that lost loved ones. People don't know how this disaster destroys families. When you lose a mother, father, sister, daughter, a son, it just, it just has, it's like ripples in a pond. And it just causes so much pain and, and destruction. So we're going to, we're throughout the community, that's right. So we're going to continue to fight for justice uh, for those families in Buffalo, but not only the families in Buffalo, for all the families that have been the victims of racist violence. You know, it's, it's when I was pulling out the banners for today, you know, we have the Emmanuel Nine banner here. You know, we were in this very spot. How many years ago was that, uh, Alfreda? Seven, seven years ago. When Dylan Roof walked into Mother Emanuel. Hold the banner up so people can see it. People, Dylan Roof walked into Mother Emanuel Church and sat with the people while they were praying. 
for a whole hour and then took his gun out and just killed nine people while they were praying. Hold your banner up, Dorothy. This banner here we had done about four years ago, five years ago, when we brought uh, Sarah Collins Rudolph. She is the sister of um, Deborah Collins who was one of the four little girls that were killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church. She lost her eyesight. She lost temporarily her sight in both eyes, but they saved one eye, and she's blind to this day and the other. But that sign says, we will not forget the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed in the 60s, in the 1960s. And then Emmanuel 9, 2015, and here we are today with the Buffalo 10. You know, it just goes on and on and on. But we're going to continue to fight against racist violence. We're going to continue to demand action. So thank you everybody for coming. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.